Okay. So the Framers of the U.S. Constitution clearly had concerns about government officials being able to being able to abuse their power, but they also had some serious concerns about the way that we the people would act if we would be allowed to make decisions. The framers were not big fans. They argue that in a number of places in the, in the Federalist Papers, and we can also see that in terms of the system that they set up, that they did not think that people should have too much authority. But as we're going to talk about, just as there was this difficult balancing act for government officials where they, the national government needed to have more authority than it had under the Arts of Confederation, but you were worried that that power could be abused, the framers were also concerned because they wanted to make sure that our system of government was one that had buy-in from we the people, that we the people, as they say in the U.S. Constitution, the preamble, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. And so it was meant to be that the authority of this system of government came from we the people, but you can't trust people. And so how do you deal with that? And so first of all, we want to talk about the first part of that, which is the ways in which we can see in the U.S. Constitution that they didn't trust we the people. The idea is particularly um, articulated in the idea of saying that we the people and what we want could also be seen as mob rule or tyranny of the majority. Those are all terms that are used by the framers to talk about their concerns about decisions that we as a group of people might do. And so what they needed to do was to put a check on majority rule in the U.S. Constitution. Even though there are ways in which majority rule matters, in order for a bill to become a law, it is a majority vote of the House and a majority of the U.S. Senate. It is a majority of the Electoral College that decides the President of the United States. It's a majority decision by the Supreme Court justices for a ruling to be handed down. So there is certainly majoritarian rule in the U.S. Constitution, but there are ways in which majority rule is not being used. There are ways in which we the people do not have um, a say, even though majority rule is part of, a key part of the idea of democracy, as we saw in Chapter 1. And so what we want to do is to take a look at the checks on majority rule in the U.S. Constitution. And the biggest one takes a little bit of time to talk about um, it's one that helps us go through specifically yet again how long the uh, members of, of the U.S. government are in office and things like that, the way they're selected. And that is the observation. One half of one branch was originally chosen by we the people. So the original plan that we saw uh, when we talk about the history of it was to say that you'd have a House of Representatives and a U.S. Senate. The House of Representatives would be chosen by we the people. And that is the one where you see the most input by we the people. But the U.S. Senate, according to the original plan, was chosen by the state legislatures, not by voting by the people, but by the state legislature there to represent the interests of the state governments. And the state governments may have very different things than the members of the state and uh, the, the people who live in the state. Um, and so that was the original rule until the 17th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1913 created the direct election of senators. At that point, we switched to a system, say, in the U.S. House of Representatives and in the U.S. Senate. But the original plan said only one, one half of the legislative branch, the House of Representatives, would be, direct, would be elected by we the people. The uh, Electoral College is responsible for choosing the President of the United States. The branch is chosen by the President of the United States, and confirmed by a majority vote of the U.S. Senate. And to get even more technical is that it is a President of the United States who is chosen by the Electoral College, so already farther removed from the influence of we the people, and then confirmed by the U.S. Senate. And the U.S. Senate, according to the original plan, and true up until 1913, was chosen by the state legislatures. And then once in office, Justices, federal justices at the Supreme Court, federal court level, and at the district federal court level are all there for life. They never face we the people as voters. And so in that sense, the judicial branch, as we've talked about when we talked about um, the ideas of democracy and the democracy standard, are meant to be separated from we the people in important ways. They didn't want us people to have influence over the judicial branch because they thought judges should be allowed to judge and make unpopular decisions. It doesn't matter what a majority wants. They're supposed to judge based on what is right, what the Constitution says, what the situation says. And to make it possible for the judicial branch to do it, they separated them from we the people. It was done on purpose. Sovereignty 
these restrictions on popular rule, the existence of the Electoral College, the idea that originally the U.S. Senate was chosen by state legislatures, the fact that the judicial branch is chosen by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and they're there for life, is a restriction on popular sovereignty. And so for that reason, there are many people who argue that we have an 18th century document for a 21st century world. We should get rid of some of those things. We should make them more democratic. And those are things that um, people have proposed at different times in different ways of changing our system of government. But in order to do that, you would have to amend the U.S. Constitution, which, as we've already talked about, is a very difficult thing to do. It takes two-thirds of the national government, of the House and the Senate, or two-thirds of the states to, rat to propose amendments to the U.S. Constitution and three-fourths of the states to radical to do. And so if you hear people talking about this idea and saying, this is what we need to do, you have to take that a little bit with a grain of salt of whether or not that is possible. But as we're going to be talking about in a little bit, there are ways in which the Constitution has been amended, and then it is possible, but it is just very difficult to do. And so you can't be easily persuaded by people who say, oh, well, we'll just change the Constitution, because it's not that easy to do. But going back to the main point here is that this is an important check on majority rule in the U.S. constitutional plan. One half of one branch, only one half of one branch is chosen by we the people. The other parts of the legislative branch, as well as the other branches, are chosen in other methods by different constituencies. And therefore, they might have different interests and they might disagree with one another. So it actually supports the idea of separation of powers and checks and balances is that the terms in office also point out some important things. House representatives are going to be in office for two years, the U.S. Senate for six years, the executive branch, the President of the United States official branch for life. And so the idea behind giving the House representatives the shortest term in office is an indication the framers said people are going to change their minds pretty quickly. And so they may want one thing one time, and then a couple of years later they're going to change their minds. And so if you want people's input, Fine, let them have that. And that goes back to the H.L. Mencken quote we had when we talk about democracy, this idea that the people deserve to get what they want good and hard, that people will want things, but they're going to change their minds. They're going to be a bit flaky. They're going to be convinced one day that they want to have, for example, uh, something along the lines of Obamacare. Once it's put into place, they hate that, and they want to get rid of it. And then when people talk about getting rid of it, they freak out and, and don't want to lose um, what they already have. And so those changing of opinions is something the framers thought was going to be inherent in terms of what um, people are going to be like. And so they said, fine, the U.S. Senate will be there for six years, so they will be hopefully more mature and take more time to think about these things. The president's in between. It has a four branches chosen for life. And again, that's there to make sure that judges are free to judge, to use the law, to use an interpretation of the Constitution as a way to make decisions, not worrying about running for re-election. Um, and so in this way, when you think about this, it is rethinking the idea of this idea of balance. Separation of powers and checks and balances certainly restrict the power of the national government and, and government officials from abusing their power. But it is also a way to restrict the power of we the people. The people's house, the House of Representatives, is only part of the process of a bill becoming a law. It must pass the House and the Senate to be sent to the president. And the president can then veto that. And if, even if the president doesn't veto that legislation, the judicial branch can rule that unconstitutional. And then the state governments might have some, say, approach and issue that overlaps with what the national government is doing. They can support or undermine the decisions made at the national government level. So in that sense, built within this one observation, an, a, a description of the entire system of government and how it works together. Another way in which we know that the framers of the U.S. Constitution don't trust we the people is the most obvious one that, uh, in describing it, is that at the national level there is no direct democracy. They knew direct democracy existed, they knew about Athens and other attempts to do it, and they were very afraid of having the system of direct democracy. They didn't want people to make decisions directly, and so they didn't include it. At the national level, there is no direct democracy. At the state level, in certain states, and some states don't have it, but California does, it does not only as direct and indirect democracy, but we have provisions of direct democracy in the California system. But at the national level, there is no role for direct democracy. It is not included in any way. And then finally is this observation, again, about the difficulty to amend the Constitution. Two-thirds to propose, three-fourths to ratify. We've gone over this enough, so if it's not on the exam, that's my bad. Um, it's your bad for not studying it, but clearly recognizing some of the decision rules and why that is and, and that why it is a higher bar to propose and to ratify amendments to the U.S. Constitution.
which players are responsible for it. Um, but the difficulty to amend the U.S. Constitution is clearly successful in the sense of if it is meant to, to keep in place the system that was created by the framers, it's been pretty successful that way. Um, there have only been 27 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Ten came in together with the Bill of Rights. You then had three came in after the Civil War. You had Prohibition and got rid of it. So in terms of the number of times the Constitution has been changed, it's relatively small. And so some people then go further and argue that that is an indication that the framers got it right. But they are really good at coming up with a voting rule that makes it difficult procedurally to uh, change the Constitution. So in that sense, you could either take a procedural or a substantive view of democracy. The substantive view is the framers were endowed by their creator with these insight in terms of how things are going to be done. And so therefore, this perfect system is very hard to change and we shouldn't change it. So there's some normative implications to it. But the other is just procedurally, it's really, really hard to get three-fourths to agree to anything particularly in a polarized system like we have right now, where if you're a Democrat and, and saying something, Republicans are automatically going to disagree with you um, and vice versa, then it's very difficult procedurally to change the Constitution. And so another way of taking is a quotation made by Sidney George Fisher. And that person is not someone who I know all that well, but his observation is one that I want us to think about is this idea of saying that a fixed, unchangeable government for a changeable, advancing people is impossible. And the, the way to note when he wrote this is important. So this was in 1862. The Civil War started in 1861. 1861 to 1865 is the Civil War. So this was, his observation was written and published during the Civil War, a recognition that the U.S. Constitution wasn't being able to get the work done that it needed to get done. We are using a Civil War to deal with the challenges of slavery. About that when we talk about the history of it, is the only way that slavery could be abolished in our system of government was nothing in the U.S. Constitution that says that a civil war is possible. And so we had to go outside of the Constitution to solve this. But his observation is that the U.S. Constitution, particularly because of the difficulty to amend the Constitution, two-thirds to propose, three-fourths to ratify, means that, in fact, we are stuck with this system, even if we would like to make changes, even if we think that we should directly elect the President of the United States, even if we think that judges should face the voters every once in a while, even if we think that the number of U.S. senators should change based on population, so California should have more U.S. senators than Wyoming, and no offense to Wyoming, well, not that much. But the idea is that any of those changes are going to require constitutional amendments because the rules are put into the Constitution, and it's very difficult to amend the Constitution. And because the framers had this negative view of we the people and the input that we have, popular sovereignty is not necessarily a huge aspect of the U.S. Constitution. And we're stuck with that because it is so hard to amend the Constitution.